my romance with uh, mathematics started very early in my life. I was uh, very attracted to some of the expressions, mathematical expressions and equations that I saw in uh, some of my father's uh, periodicals. I don't know what attracted uh, me to those. And that time I, was, uh, I started reading some of my father's physics books, his high school physics books. You know, at that early age, I was like eight or nine years old. Physics is something that you can relate uh, more to real life than abstract mathematics. Because you can, play, you can have fun with physics, you can uh, do experiments, and you can uh, relate it with uh, like real life experiences. So that's how uh, you know, it started with mathematics and me. Uh, then I got this book on uh, Ramanujan. Uh, it's uh, called A Man Who Knew Infinity. And after reading that book, while reading that book, I got attracted to number theory. If you read the statement of Farmer's Last Theorem, you can understand what it's asking. And uh, then you can try to use whatever imagination that you have to try to solve it. it it's not the uh, same with other branches of mathematics. When I uh, joined uh, Princeton University as a graduate student, my advisor was Andrew Wiles, and uh, he gave me a problem uh, which falls in the realm of uh, L functions, special values of L functions. So the problem was about families of elliptic curves, and one, have to, one has to find curves in that family which has positive rank. So that was a very hard problem, and uh, I started working on it. And from there, that point, I kind of branched to analytic number theory and the theory of L functions, and also started learning about Taffentine problems, the circle method, the sieve methods, and all that. Then I graduated uh, from Princeton and moved to Rutgers as a postdoc. My advisor there was Hendrik Vanich, and from him, I kind of picked up a lot of analytic number theory, and my interest shifted more towards analytic number theory at that point. Then I returned to India and uh, at that point, uh, around 2010 or so, uh, the subconvexity problem uh, was kind of uh, in fashion because uh, there is this problem about quantum unique ergodicity, which uh, is related to subconvexity and people were trying very hard to solve that uh, problem. And uh, around 2010, uh, Lyndon Strauss and Sandra Rajan found a way to do a QE without proving subconvexity. But people were trying to get QE using subconvexity, and I got interested in that. And it's about subconvexity of higher degree L function. Uh, the degree two L functions were already solved, and I had to do this degree three L function. So when I got back to India, I started working on it, and it took a long time. It looked like five years to really uh, do something in that field. Working with uh, Andrew Wiles was, let's say, was very interesting. So I'll tell you why. Because his way of thinking is completely different than mine. He's a very algebraic person, whereas my approach to mathematics is very analytic. So I think Wiles realized that very early uh, after I met him. Uh, so he gave me a very hard problem to solve. I was trying to do it using analytic number theory, but he never tried to convert me to an algebraic person. He was very supportive. So after so struggling with the problem for a year or so, I went to him and said that I have uh, solved the problem, but not over number fields, but over function fields. And then uh, he smiled. <laughs> and, and said, it's a pity. So, so that was the big education, you know, lesson that I got from Wiles, that never try to be satisfied by solving a very, you know, simplifying a problem and trying to solve it. If you have a mathematical problem, solve it as, as it is. Don't try to simplify it. If you look at my work on L functions, so I start, so there is uh, this problem about subconvexity of L function. And the usual method of proving subconvexity is to take moments. 
Okay. So, what you do is you embed the particular L function that you are looking at into a family of L functions and then you compute the moment in that family. And from the bound of the, of the moment, you try to retrieve a bound for the individual function. So, that is the moment method, but it worked for uh, degree 1 and de degree 2 L functions, but no one knew how to make it work for degree 3. So, people got stuck in degree 3. So, when I started working on self convexity, my first thing I did is uh, you know to get a different method. So, I knew that the moment method does not work because uh, there is a reason behind it. Okay. It is not like you know if you have to tighten some bolts or nuts and it will work. So, my start was uh, you know it was one sum of harmonics and I just in introduce an one new variable that is kind of uh, taking a step backward. So, you already have a very small sum and you are kind of at, at the threshold of proving the sub convex bound, it is you have to just prove a non trivial bound for that sum. So, what I do is I introduce a new variable and that takes you far away from where the threshold. Okay. So, it, it makes the problem much more complicated, but then if once you do that there are other things that you can introduce and then by some uh, you know there is a summation formula as a functional equation you can play around with, with those and then you can reach the threshold again using a very different detour and from that and then you will see that there is something that you can do extra which was not possible when you uh, were stuck at the threshold at the beginning. A large uh, part of uh, mathematical research is uh, driven by curiosity. They are not application oriented. So, the example that comes to my mind is uh, that of Pharma's little theorem. So, Pharma got this theorem back in 17th century. It is about uh, uh, it is a curious observation about prime number. So, if you take any prime number p and if you take another integer a which is not divisible by that prime then if you raise a to the power p minus 1 and then divide by p it keeps your remainder 1. So, that is a observation about uh, about a prime number. Now, after 350 years this uh, this particular observation and actually a generalization of a subsequent generalization of this observation by Weller play a critical role in uh, you know net, uh, net banking, mobile banking, e-commerce and all that. So, a part of cryptography is based on this particular theorem. So, in uh, 17th century for when Pharma got this uh, theorem it is about certain properties of prime he had no application in his mind, but after 300, 350 years now this thing is applied to something which we use every day. I think that is uh, how it is in mathematics it is like uh, what we do today may not be that useful to society right away. But maybe you wait for 100 years, 200 years, it will come back, it will help you in some way or the other. It is a big, big recognition. If you look at the, the winners in the previous years, they are all fantastic mathematicians and I have uh, very high respect for their work. And so I feel very honored to be counted as one of them or put in the same league as them.